For thousands of years, this land has been the home of the Patwing people. Today, there are three federally recognized Patwing tribes. Kachil Dehe, band of Winton Indians of the Calusa Indian community, Quetzal Dehe Winton Nation, and Yocha Dehe Winton Nation. The Patwing people have remained committed to the stewardship of this land over many centuries. It has been cherished and protected as elders have instructed the young through generations. We are honored and grateful to be on their land, on their traditional lands today. This acknowledgement is particularly appropriate because we'll be hearing about Native American food. This evening, Sips and Bites, a taste of Ohlone culture, is an exploration of traditional foods, including some fermented foods. Good evening. My name is Andrew Waterhouse, director of the Robert Mondavi Institute. The Institute strives to provide the public with insights into the food and beverage innovations at UC Davis with a focus on viticulture and enology and food science and technology. Tonight's program was inspired by our moderators. Before we begin, let me mention that your questions are welcome. Please use the Q&A tool to submit your questions. Our guests and moderators will try to answer as many as feasible after the presentations and discussion. Tonight, we have two UC Davis professors who will moderate the program. Dr. Maria Marco is a professor in the Department of Food Science and Technology at UC Davis. She is a food microbiologist with over 20 years experience investigating food fermentations and the ways in which microorganisms can promote human health. Dr. Marco teaches food microbiology to undergraduate and graduate students. She is also deeply involved in several community engagement activities, including the UC Davis EatLAC project a project designed to promote public awareness and understanding of fermented fruits and vegetables. And also we have doc, Dr. Jessica Perea, who is a UC Davis assistant professor in Native American studies and a Dena'ina Alaska Native scholar whose, whose work intersects the larger fields of Native American and indigenous studies and music and sound studies. She specializes in critical indigenous studies approaches to performance, media, and improv improvisation studies, arts and activism in North Pacific and circumpolar Arctic communities and relational studies of indigenous and black experiences and creative expressions in the Americas. Welcome, Maria and Jessica. I will now turn the floor over to you. Productions and the opportunity to work with you to organize this very special event. So as you mentioned, uh, my work centers on food microbiology and understanding how microorganisms may benefit our health through our digestive tract. In particular, I specialize in the study of lactic acid bacteria for their roles in food fermentations and as probiotics. And um, as you mentioned, through my research, teaching and service commitments, what I'm doing is striving to provide practical and inclusive approaches that allow us to relate to and understand microscopic life before we introduce our speakers, I'd first like to share a brief introduction about how Jessica, Dr. Priya, and I arrived at our collaboration and ultimately this opportunity to host Louis Trevino and Vincent Medina for tonight's Sips and Bites event on a taste of Ohlone culture. So Dr. Priya and I met just one year ago through a UC Davis led collaborative teaching initiative known as SHAPE. SHAPE stands for the Science, Humanities, and Arts Process and Engagement Program. The SHAPE program was made possible by an Andrew Mellon Foundation Award to the Mandavi Center and is focused on developing team-taught undergraduate seminars in which students encounter science and engineering and humanities, arts, and humanistic social sciences in one course. Each SHAPE course also integrates a performing artist or ensemble into the course curriculum and includes a performance for the public at the Mandavi Center. So Dr. Puri and I were fortunate enough to be selected for the SHAPE program with our proposal for a fall 2021 course entitled Radical Story Work, Performing Food Sovereignty Through Inuit Fermentation Culture. But our introduction to this collaboration would not be complete without introducing and acknowledging Dr. Aviaya Houtman. Dr. Houtman is an Inuk microbiologist from Greenland 
with expertise in Arctic metagenomics. Besides microbiology research, Dr. Hauptmann is engaged in work in indigenous-led knowledge on traditional fermented foods in Greenland. It was through having Dr. Hauptmann join my laboratory as a visiting scientist through the Carlsberg Foundation and Greenland Fellowship Council Fellowship that initiated this transformation um, with the SHAPE course collaboration. And last not, but not least, I'm also pleased to share that over the past year, our collaboratory group has already grown to include Dr. Stephanie Maroney. Dr. Steph uh, Dr. Maroney is a, currently the Mellon Public Scholars Program Manager at the Davis Humanities Institute. Dr. Maroney specializes in feminist approaches to science and food studies as a means to generate new knowledge and relations. Between the four of us, we established the Davis Humanities Institute Trans College Research Cluster on Radical and Relational Fermentation. I'll now turn the mic over to Dr. Perea to provide more background on our cluster activities and goals and how they converge in our event tonight. Yeah, they do. Jessica Bissett Perea Shiila Kilan, Dena Ina Ishlan Shida, Kena Ana Ishlan Shida. Kanakatnu Shigu Shigaya Kilanda, Sheldina Rele Te Ana Ishlan Shida, Skizlan Reyatnu, Shukta Shukta Ale Nita, Shigu Kotan Rana Raluda, Yalamu Ramaya Tushaloni Tlena, Shigu Yashduda, Puta Toy, Pat Winetlena, Ka Shigu Yashduda, Shinan Hesh Kashashnu, Dena Inak Duleshi. My name is Jessica Pisapraya, and I am joining you tonight from my musicology lab here in Yalamu, Rumaya Tushaloni lands, or what is also known as San Francisco, California. By way of framing the significance of tonight's event, I would like to offer some brief opening, opening comments regarding the need to engage in work, be that research, teaching, or community service, and more, that seeks to better understand how indigenous ways of being, our identities and lived experiences, and indigenous ways of knowing, our philosophies and logics are embodied in indigenous ways of doing, our ways of relationality, um, and in this case tonight, creative and performing arts. Our trans college research cluster engages a convergent arts plus sciences approach to indigenous fermented foods research with by and for indigenous peoples, which requires often performative juxtap juxtapositions, the simultaneous bringing together and keeping apart of core priorities and projects from several broad research areas, including Native American and Indigenous Studies, Food Science and Technology Studies, and Performance Studies, just to name three. Our collaboratory work centers three core objectives, which include uh, to understand Indigenous fermentation practices through Indigenous knowledge systems, which are always already in relation to natural environments, uh, to evaluate community practices that have undergone changes in recent generations, especially our built environments and increased reliance on um, non-Indigenous materials and material culture. To uplift Indigenous knowledge systems, social networks, and community-based practices related to preparing and eating fermented foods as a means to advance community health and wellness. And tonight um, functions as a night of firsts for a radical fermentation collaboratory, of which I will just highlight four. Um, for example, this event is one of our first public facing gatherings, so we're very pleased to be here with you all tonight. And it is one of the first of many collaborations, we hope, with the Robert Mandavi Institute for Wine and Food Science. So thank you to everybody at RMI. From my perspective as a Denaina woman and critical indigenous studies scholar, uh, the third first uh, is, is perhaps more important to me in terms of an opportunity to pose and consider what might, one might call an indigeneity question of our work here at UC Davis. Uh, in other words, what happens to our research, teaching, and service activities if we put indigenous peoples, places, and practices at its center? And uh, the fourth and maybe more significant for tonight uh, is our ability to take this question one step further by asking, what happens to food science and technology studies at UC Davis if we put indigenous peoples and foodways of California at its center? Given our campus's responsibilities as a land grab, or what is also known as a land grant university, our radical fermentation collaboratory is pleased to partner with Makaham tonight to begin uh, new indigenous led and indigeneity centered collaborations on the topics of food security and food sovereignty in ways that literally ground us where we are 
and cultivate generative and sustainable partnerships between the University of California Davis and local indigenous communities. So tonight we are honored to share this space with Luis Trevino and Vincent Medina and to share in the sensory centered practice and, and experience of learning about our relationality with Ohlone peoples, places and practices. So we would now like to turn things over to Makaham co-founders Luis Trevino and Vincent Medina who will introduce themselves, uh, offer stories of the cafe's uh, creation story and coming into being and they will guide us through a taste of Ohlone culture. So thank you. Thank you for that introduction. I'd like to start by introducing ourselves in Chochenyo in Romsen languages, the languages of our families. Nesa makrote halkin ware, hemen tuhi makrote halkin ware, horshe ware, manni hemen maksuyak mahiswi, uyakish ne tuhi at makushish tak aye, makin roket arshit tamak michiya at hemen maksuyak makush uyakish, wak imimo makin hinshush, maknunu at mak amham at makin rote. Horshe makware hemmen tuhi. Nesa kmaknani rakat luish trivino ki. Mishik mur imme makam. Karakt luis trivino ka itmai kakon tahuya achistai pire. In karukat chia misik halkin imen takamoish vincent medina. In kashuninin imme shatu shakai. Chia chia rotet. What Lewis and myself just shared in our respective Ohlone languages, Lewis spoke in Rumsin, which is the indigenous language of Carmel Valley, and I spoke in Chochenyo, which is the indigenous language of here in the Inner East Bay, where we're speaking to you from. We said good evening to you all. Once again, I'm Vincent Medina, here with my partner, Louis Trevino, and we're the co-founders of Makam Ham. Importantly, in this introduction, what we said as well is that we acknowledge and give gratitude to the generations before us who allow us to be here. The generations before us that allow us to still be birthed on our homeland, still be able to keep our culture alive in our lives, and be able to see healing happen all around. Our elders, they make this possible for us and the undeniable strength of all those generations that we came from, that we come from, who always knew that our culture was worthy of being protected and continued. Those generations before us, they allowed the conditions that make it possible to create an organization like Makam Ham or to be able to create an establishment like Cafe Aloni Without the work of those generations before, we wouldn't be able to do this. So before we do let's give this presentation, we'd like to acknowledge once again, our grandparents, our great grandparents, our parents, our aunties, our uncles, and all of our ancestors, who their strength allows us to be able to exist today. And their strength also allows us to be able to have so much pride in who we are and who we come from. We're going to be sharing a presentation with you this evening, and then that's going to lead into a tasting of, of these foods for those of you who are able to have a box in front of you. But those who, who don't have a box, we also want you to be part of this experience fully. And so we're going to walk you through some of our history, as well as the flavors that are indigenous to our culture, to this part of California during springtime. We also want to acknowledge where we're speaking to you from, Halkin Ware, which is right here along San Lorenzo and San Leandro Creeks. This area that we're speaking to you from, which is in the East Bay, you can think about 10 miles south of Oakland. This area that we're speaking to you from is where all of my family has always lived, from those beginning days of our creation to where we're at today in 2021. Every generation of our people has consistently been right here with no interrupt and no break. 
because of all of those generations before us, we can continue to be here in this hyper-localized specific area that I'm very happy that Lewis is a part of as well. We're going to be talking a bit about how the land shapes our culture, but I want to acknowledge this beautiful Hiswi water birthland that we come from, where we're speaking to you from. We also want to acknowledge as well the Patuan community and all of the work that's been done to be able to bring recognition of the Patuan community to, uh, to UC Davis as well. And we acknowledge our Patuan relations and also um, those deep ties, of course, that communities have to where UC Davis is occupying. Just to start off, makamham, it means our food in Chochenyo language, again, which is the native language of the Inner East Bay. And we created Makamham, an organization back uh, that, that centered on food justice. We created this organization in September of 2017. We because we saw as young people the success of the revival of other aspects of our culture that were heavily suppressed, but still kept finding a way to be carried on because of that strength that comes from the generations before us. As young people, in our teenage years and in our 20s, we saw how old wounds could be healed. We saw how our language can begin to become more conversationally fluent again. We saw how our old stories could be renewed. We saw how land stewardship practices could become commonplace again. We saw also how our community, even though colonization impacted us, and it impacted us in a way that was painful, that still has effects on our life today. Never accepted defeat either. But we always saw those older generations of our families, how they would carry themselves with so much pride and so much dignity. They carried themselves with so much pride because they know, they knew who they came from and they knew the value of our culture. We always saw those old timers when we were growing up our aunties, our uncles, our grandparents, elder cousins, and those older generations of our family, they reminded us, again, that victories and triumphs, that that's part of our story as well, as indigenous people, as Ohlone people, not only losses and defeats as what are often presented in mainstream education. We want people to know who are listening to this tonight, to know that us as Ohlone people, us as people from this part of California, we don't see ourselves as being defeated. We don't see ourselves as, as, as having to see our culture be defeated either. But we see what we are descended from as being something victorious, triumphant, and something again, that's rooted in persistence and love for these old ways. I'd like to show you just a map that's right here before we go into some of the images and the, the talk specifically about food of what Ohlone country looks like. So this is, uh, if you're familiar with this part of California, you'll recognize where we're at right here, the San Francisco Bay going down to Monterey Bay. And something that I think is important to highlight about this map is that we're not just one people, us Ohlone people. But in the old days, a series of independent nations, nowadays we call them microstates, is what the, common, um, what the common terminology is to refer to a small independent nation of its own. But each one of these nations that you see here that are in the very small type, that's uh, smaller, that, that are in each colored coded area, each one of those nations is a small independent nation of its own, completely sovereign, but also interconnected in these beautiful dynamic ways. Traditionally, Ohlone people speak at the very least eight different core languages. Today, three of those languages are still spoken today. Chochenyo, the East Bay Ohlone language, Rumsen, the Carmel Valley Ohlone language, Monterey area from Lewis's family, and Mutsin, which is in the San, um, San Juan Batista area. Out of those eight languages, three languages have survived, which again, reminds of how hard colonization impacted this part of California. When colonization came, it came hard with three waves impacting and working to destroy our traditional culture here in this area 
and remove our people from the land itself. In the late 1700s, the Spanish, they invaded California. Our ancestors were already living in these well-established borders. If you look on a more localized scale here in the East Bay, this is what these nations look like. My family specifically comes from Halkin Irhin, which is in the central part of the inner East Bay, as well as the Miwok speaking nation of Saklan in the Oakland Berkeley Hills. I also want to acknowledge my family that comes from Elamne, which is about 10 miles, um, 10 miles um, south of Davis. And that's uh, again, those, uh, those missions that, that came here to California they would often um, reach out to bring in more and more people from further, further away later into the mission period. But many of these uh, relationships, they already existed here throughout California because of this dynamic way of coexisting with one another. California, this part of California, many people are just beginning to come to terms with how rich, how abundant, and how populated this area traditionally is. Many people are just beginning to learn that anywhere north of the Aztec Empire, Tenochtitlan, the densest population of indigenous people in all of the Western Hemisphere is right here in the San Francisco Bay Area. The same reasons that people want to live here today, excellent weather, water, abundance of all kinds. It's a really wonderful, great place to live, of course, but this has never been a secret to our ancestors. Our ancestors lived well in this place, lived with abundance, lived in a way that, that allowed all of the abundance to even grow greater. And I'll share with all of you how we see ourselves as part of this landscape. The story that we're taught by our elders about how we came to be here, it has the, the place where this all happened for us as Ohlone people from this area, from the East Bay, is we're taught that there was a great flood when everything in the world was covered with water, everything was flooded, except for the two peaks of Tuushtak, the place of the day. Many people know this mountain today as Mount Diablo. There on top of that mountain was the only area that, were, that there was dry land and everything else was flooded. And there on top of that mountain, our creator created the world after those waters receded. But us humans, we weren't the first ones around. There was life that existed here of all kinds. Balance had to be created before humans were ever arrived. There had to be safety that was created, evil that was defeated. And one day when it was ripe, us humans from this area, we came to be. But we were taught, and this is still something that's passed on in our families, that we're part of this land but it's not all centered on us. We're taught in those beginning stories that we still believe, that we still hold dear, that we also have to contribute to this abundance, that we can't just only take, but we have to be a part of the management of this space. And for thousands and thousands of years, too many years to ever count, our ancestors did just that. They managed this area, in a way that was meaningful, that made sense, and that worked. They tended to this area through a series of controlled burns, prescribed burns, that would happen regularly in specific areas. And what that would do is open up meadows, clear out overgrowth, allow interconnected plant communities that are connected with one another, and not just connected with other plants, but connected to all life, allow those things to be able to grow even stronger. They would pick off young growths on bulbs, drop those into that enriched soil, making sure that next year's harvest would even grow larger. They made sure to open up space for animal life. They made sure that all of this abundance, again, only grew stronger the next year. We're taught this also in our, in, in our beginning stories too, about our place in this land, by understanding that it's not just only on us first as people, we're taught by our aunties, and I want to acknowledge our auntie Billy, who teaches us that when the acorns drop, the first drop of that acorns isn't for us humans, even though we could eat it, that first drop has to be for the animals, other life, to make sure that they have enough food to eat too. Remembering our relationship 
and also remembering that we have responsibilities to other life that's around us. Our ancestors, they recognize the personhood of plants. They recognize that life of all sorts is interconnected. And the system that they had, those old timers, it worked. It works so well that here in this part of California, even in our dictionary, we don't have a word for famine because there was always enough. There was always a backup if something didn't come through. For an example, if our black oak acorn didn't, wasn't, there wasn't in abundance one year, you could always go to another acorn variety, valley oak acorn, for an example. If the valley oak acorns weren't available, you could always go to Buckeye. There was always an alternative that was there. There was always enough. The system worked. Our ancestors also knew that California, this part of California, it had to burn. Otherwise, we would be in a fire drought, like what we're seeing today. And today, we're seeing the consequences of living in a space that's not managed by human hands in the way that it should be. But our ancestors, they knew. They had the answers. And it's a reminder that this wisdom, it's relevant and it's alive, and that us as indigenous people here to California, and specifically for us as Ohlone people, that this wisdom, that it's valuable, and that our culture, it shouldn't just be relegated to something of the past, but should be looked at as something in the present and something that's going to be increasingly important to the public as well in the future, because our culture is valuable. And we, we know that we're valuable too. This map that's here, again, this is that older political landscape. Now, I want you to all just to look at this, at these names that are here. Hokin, Irhin, Saklan, Tatkan, Chupkan, Volvon, Hulpun. Within this map, that's about 60 miles by 60 miles. Within this map right here, every single part of this map is represented by a different language group. Um, well, for the most part, in different areas. And let me just describe this to you. Here on the East Bay, the inner East Bay right here, this is all Chochenyo Ohlone speaking. There's one language that's right there. If you go just a slightly further east, that's all um, Bay Miwok language that's spoken, Miwok language, slightly further east in the Oakland Berkeley Hills. You go up north of that to Karkin, that right there, that's all going into um, Karkin Ohlone speaking area. You go further east of that, that's all Yokut's speaking area. If you go down further south of that, that's all Tamian speaking area. And then if you go into the San Francisco Peninsula, that's Ramaytush speaking area. So six different Ohlone, six different languages, not all of them Ohlone languages. Four of them are Ohlone languages, but there's also Miwok and Yokuts there too, which again shows that diversity which we always want to remind people that California has always been a cosmopolitan, diverse place. This is nothing new with whites arriving here, but this is something that's always been the case here in California. In California, it's the most linguistically diverse area in the entire world, with over 120 different indigenous languages, core languages, not even including dialects, just spoken within the modern boundaries of the states. There's over a hundred different tribes in California, and with that, over a hundred different centers of the world, meaning that where our world was created on Pushtak, Mount Diablo, might be radically different from our friends, it would be radically different from our friends who are up north, who are Karuk or Hupa or Yurok, or our friends down south, who might be Tongva or Kumiai or Kuwia, or even people going slightly down into where Lewis's family's from in Carmel and Big Sur area. And that ability to coexist in a world of plenty, but still be able to find meaningful ways to engage, to live, to intermarry, to have ceremony together, trade together, while still speaking different languages, having different centers of the world, having different religious beliefs, basketry traditions, all of that. That's something that we still have pride in, in California, in the California Indian world today, is being able to live in a world of abundance and diversity, but still being able to make sense of it and live in a way that's rich and meaningful. Our ancestors lived with this richness, with this meaning, with this dignity. 
and we want people to know that. And these foods that we're going to talk about in just a couple of minutes are really going to um, be something that emphasizes that point. I'm going to skip forward so that we can get into this tasting. But something that I want to mention just before I do is again about these hardships that came with colonization. I like to talk so much of this old world because we're still, after 240 years, trying to get back into these old ways. We know the value of this. And that's a reminder. We don't try for 242, 243 years to get back into the old ways of doing something unless you're taught the value of those things over multiple generations that span, um, that go going back into before the invasion happened. But when the Spanish came here to California, they forced our ancestors into the mission system where every single aspect of our culture was suppressed. Our people survived those places, of course, but we have to acknowledge the people that didn't. The Spanish were only here for 65 years in California, but the harm that they caused, those missions caused, is still something that we're grappling with, even today. We just got to look to our last names to see the impact of the mission that's still on our lives. But it's important to know that survival is also a part of those places. After those missions were over, when Americans came in in the 1840s, there was a brief time of Mexican occupation that was very short and also very painful. But when Americans came in, that's when there was a genocide that was legalized against our community. The very first American governor of California, a man named Peter Burnett, said in 1852 that there has to be a war of extermination against the Indian race until the race becomes extinct. During that time as well, when the passage of California Indians Act was passed, which legalized Indian slavery, it also banned the controlled burns that our ancestors would steward this land with. So if you could imagine these conditions, imagine 65 years of slavery in the missions, imagine land being taken away, land that our people have always lived on, that was even deeded back to our people after the missions, but then taken, by Americans coming in, or at least so they thought it was taken. And, but in title, having that not be recognized as indigenous land. Then on top of that, having massacres legalized and genocide legalized against our people, seeing land that was once our families be deeded over to white landholders through homestead acts, or, or even worse, by running people off the land very violently. Then on top of that, enabling uh, Indian slavery to happen, our people weren't citizens of the United States until 1924. Our people had, very, had, had no legal protections here. Now understanding this context, that also helps understand again, the bravery of being able to carry on these traditions in spite of those conditions that were being imposed on our people. We are confident and we, we have every single um, knowledge available that's been passed on about that strength that comes from those generations before. And that's why it's so important to center them and to make sure that they're getting that recognition that they deserve. We're just doing what they trained us to do, what they wanted us to do, which is to carry our culture full forward. Now let's skip through to some of these images right here because I'd like to show you some of the earliest images of our people, but then also to be able to go into a contemporary community that we're a part of as well. To show again that this image was painted in 1816 of Ohlone people and Miwok people from right here in this area. And showing again this work that we're doing, this is an acorn gathering trip that we had um, just a few months ago when COVID cases were lower, uh, to be able to keep our acorn traditions going strong. I'm going to stop right here for just a moment because I want to get into our tasting time. And for this, we're going to say a phrase together, which is nani mak, which means let's taste. Now these tastings that we're going to have together, for those of you that are, are having a tasting box in front of you, we're going to introduce what you're going to be eating. And then after this, we're going to describe so that those who don't have a box, you can be fully part of this experience as well. We want you to understand what these foods represent to our community. For our first bite here, 
we're going to have fermented Indian lettuce, which we call rore in our language. Sometimes it's referred to as miner's lettuce. We respectfully ask you all, please do not refer to it as that. Miners were here in California for a short time, not very long at all. And that's so unfair to give them all the credit for this delicious food that native people here in California have been eating forever. And also it's a food that our people have always stewarded too. Always gather, always made sure to gather in respectful ways. And we still are doing that even nowadays. But this, this uh, fermented ro uh, rore, excuse me, it's also with uh, coyote flowers added, we call mai antiguish, and also scallion, which substitutes for our Indian onion. And this is something that we're very proud of because this is a contemporary uh, dish that we're going to be sharing with all of you for our first tasting, which is kimchi by our friends over at Sister House Korean Restaurants. And the ladies who run Sister House, as well as the um, as well as uh, the, the owner's husband, Jessica's husband, we approached them and we asked them if they would be interested in doing this. And they were extremely happy that we would reach out to them. And we told them we wouldn't do this without your without your your uh, permission because we don't want to kimchi, which is a Korean tradition somebody, um, our, our greens using another, another culture's method. We, we don't wanna uh, do reverse cultural appropriation or anything like that. So we wanted to make sure that we were doing this in a respectful way. So we approached them, we asked them if we could implement our greens into their, um, into their dish and they were happy to do it. Let's, uh, as we eat this first bite together, there's a few things that I just want us to be able to, to notice. And yes, I did. Um, this isn't something that was refrigerated, but with kimchi, we asked, and it's fine for up to three days for kimchi because of the fermentation process, as long as it's stored in a, in a cool area for it to be out of the refrigerator, as long as it's properly sealed. And by using these jars, we wanted to make sure that it was sealed in the safest way. So we're eating this with you all. But this is um, going to be a few different flavors that are here. The first one is going to be the young growth rore, the Indian lettuce. The second is going to be the spicy uh, mayan tiwish, the coyote flowers, which sometimes they're called nasturtiums, and also the pepperiness of the onion as well. Now, this is a contemporary hybrid dish but made with those greens that are gathered right here in our homeland. And we want to acknowledge Berkeley Student Farms as well for growing the Indian lettuce, the coyote flowers, and the nasturtium for us. So with this, before we have any bite, we say ammamak, which means let's eat. So ammamak rore mayantiwish at unir. So let's eat this beautiful Indian lettuce, coyote flowers, and onion together. You might notice it has some heat, um, which I personally really love. It's a, it's a delicious food. And this, we're going to ask our friends over at the Korean restaurant if we can make this a regular dish because we love the flavor of it. And for anybody who's eating this with us, we, um, we hope that you do too. Our next dish that we're going to have the hits here. This is something that's also going to, for those who might need it, to cut the heat. We're going to begin to have a tasting of our, of our tea that we have highlighted here, which is mamakwa at tawasi. And this tea that's here, it's a tea that's made from rose petal, rose hip, and stingy nettle. A few things that I want to mention before we have a sip together of this is that mamakwa, the rose plant, the California rose plants, that rose is something that we, um, that we drink for a whole bunch of reasons. So many of these teas 
they've been taught to us by our elders. And I want to acknowledge my auntie, my auntie Dottie. She's a 90 year old respected Ohlone elder from my family. And Auntie Dottie, she teaches us a lot about the foods that she ate when she was a young girl that her mother gave her. And one of the things when we first started Cafe Ohlone was we were telling her about um, some of the foods that we're serving. And she said, make sure you serve the rose hip tea. She said that her mom would always have that on the stove, always have that available. So of course we wanna to listen to our elders. But the rose hip tea, it's also a tea, one reason that Auntie Dottie loves it so much is because of how good it is for your health. It's super high for your immune system. It's very good in keeping your immune system prime during, uh, during stressful times or during times of sickness. And also the rose petals are calming. They help to alleviate stress. They also have vitamin C in them too. Something else as well, just that we like to add is that our ancestors, they would make a concentrated face wash with the rose hip tea. And this is something that goes back thousands of years because rose hips, they also build collagen, which is a reminder that our people always like looking fresh. And that's something that hasn't changed at all over all these generations. But Ohlone people would wash their faces with rose hip tea to keep their face firm and their skin looking good. Finally, the stinging nettle is something that we call tawa, by the way. The stinging nettle, it's um, something that is especially good for your respiratory health. And as we're having more wildfires in California nowadays, as the air isn't as clean as it always was, and especially with spring allergies coming up for some people, having clear respiratory health is always important. The stinging nettle tea it helps with respiratory health and lung health. And this is the tea that we recommended early in the pandemic so that people's lungs could be working to their best capacity. Also, the stinging nettle plant is used to make cordage in our culture. And traditionally, and even to this day, uh, for our elders, um, they whip themselves with uh, stinging nettle because the, it injects um, something that's a numbing sensation that helps alleviate the pain. My grandmother, she's one of those people as well that uses stinging nettle as something to to whip that pain away. And so again, reminding how strong the elders are too. But this, uh, this tea, we left it unsweetened. You're welcome to add sweetener if you like to it later, honey, but we recommend you try it as it is first, just to try those pure flavors of the stingy nettle, the rose and the rose hips. So enjoy. Ooh, at the mock, let's drink. It's very calming. And please save some of that tea for sips in between your other bites as well. The next one that's here, the next recipe that we're going to be sharing with all of you is a very contemporary Ohlone recipe that we call Raoni, which is the Chochenyo pronunciation of brownie. And Raoni, it's a dish that Lewis right here gets all the credit for. Lewis is the brownie chef and the brownie expert. And would you like to talk a little bit about why we, we made these brownies or you made these brownies? At the start of Makam in 2017, we organized a family camp out and it was in the fall time and it was a storytelling camp out. Vince had worked on a number of old time stories from here in the East Bay recorded by family before and worked on these beautiful translations into Chochenyo language from Spanish and English and English translations that would be easy uh, for the family to read. And when we brought family together for that experience where we also shared many of our traditional foods, we realized that a lot of the people uh, who were coming were young people, teenage and younger. And at this camp out, we planned on introducing acorn um, to family members and including that old time acorn soup and acorn bread. But we wanted to find a way to make it uh, in a creative way to make it immediately gratifying to some of these young people who were there. And so the brownies seemed like a perfect vehicle for the acorn flour. Um, these brownies that you'll be having are made with our ground chia seeds. Um, when we created the brownies, we thought that we might phase them out 
as those young people became more accustomed to that old time acorn soup and the acorn bread. But elders in our families, they loved these brownies and they told us not to get rid of them. So we listened um, and we always say that this is a, a, a really wonderful organic example of not having to um, choose contemporary or traditional that these things can coexist and have value. Exactly. And just like the kimchi, it's a reminder that our culture, that it's not locked into just one period of time, that we can be able to implement our ingredients in ways that our community likes to our taste preferences, but making sure that it's on our terms and doing that in a way that's contemporary, that's modern, and that's also fun too. These brownies, I wanna give acknowledgement to Lewis for, for this uh, masterful brownie bakery that's right here. So with this, um, we're going to share a bite of our chia seed and hazelnut brownies with East Bay salt that we gather from the marshes a few blocks away, as well as um, adding a little bit of a duck egg for a binder in these two. Mm -hmm. And Zapotec chocolate from San Javier Dionisio. Is that the... San Dionisio. San, oh, excuse me, San Dionisio, a Copepec Pueblo in central Mexico. And uh, this is made by a woman named Doña Margarita, a chocolate maker who makes the chocolate in her family's tradition from San Dionisio of Copepec. So with that, let's enjoy a bite of around me. Thank you, enjoy. Okay, and these brownies were also featured in the New York Times too. So <laughs> just something to add to that. Finally, to end our tasting here, we're going to have a bite of our most traditional food. This is a food that goes all the way back into our creation times. And in Chochenyo, we call this Shetnen. In Chochenyo, or in Rumsen, how do you call it? Pulum. Pulum. So pulum and shetnen. All of us here in California have a word for acorn bread, and as long as we're acorn eaters, because acorn is such an essential, important part of our diet. You can think of some cultures how rice might be common, in other cultures how corn might be, in other cultures how wheat might be. Acorn is the central part of our diet. Now acorn bread, even though you might be looking at a small piece of acorn bread in front of you, this acorn bread took six months to prepare. And the reason why, it took so long. And the reason why it's such a small portion is it's because it's something to be savored and something to be treated like a fine thing, which it is. Acorn bread, we start off by gathering the acorns. They have to be cured for about six months. Then there's a long process of making the acorn into flour, which involves grinding it down into, well, first shelling them, skinning them, grinding it down into a flour that says, fine as the weave of a basket. If it's not as, if it doesn't fit in the weave of a winnowing basket, then our, um, our elders would tell us to do it again and grind it even finer. Then on top of that, after that, you have to grind it as fine as you can and then leach it, take out the bitterness, the tannic acids. And then after the acorn is leached, which takes several tries usually until you get the right, the right consistency and the right taste. After that, it's made into a thick soup. Famu, it's called. And after we have the acorn soup, the acorn bread is even an extra step after that, where then the soup has to be cooked down until it's thickened. And then after the soup is thick and thick enough to roll into bread, it has to be cooled down and then rolled and then baked, usually baked in on hot rocks, on hot stones, um, or sometimes in earth ovens. Today we use modern day ovens, but all the other parts of this process are still are still upheld in the same way. Again, we want to acknowledge our Auntie Billy, who teaches us about acorn processing, and she cooks in her grandmother's cooking basket with the hot salt stones in the old way. So we want people to know this is not just part of the past, but this is a comfort food for us today. And as we eat this acorn bread, please uh, just taste it in its purest form. So there's nothing added to it, which is the way that we're taught to make it. You don't add any sweetener to it. You don't add anything to it. 
but you just savor that acorn and its taste. And this is black oak acorn specifically. So with this, Ammamak Shetnen and Ammamak Pulu. Let's eat our acorn bread together. As you're eating this as well, please start to eat this as you're eating it. But I just want to say one thing, that this taste, it's the exact same taste that our people have been eating for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. So as you're eating this acorn bread, you're tasting, it's like a memory that's locked in time with a flavor. You're eating something that's that's the same exact flavor that's been carried on through all these generations and will be in the future too. It's my favorite. So you're going to see that as we eat the acorn, again, these tastes, how nuanced it is and how much um, of its own natural flavor that it has, how much of its own oiliness that it has. Nothing's been added to this, but just the acorn on its own. Nothing else has been added. It's just the pure acorn flour, black oak acorn flour. And again, it's one of these foods that has such a nice uh, texture because of the crust on the outside that's a natural crust, as well as that gelatinous inside interior too. So with this, we're going to open this up to questions for the last seven minutes or so that we have. But we'd like as well for you to be able to stay in contact with us. You can follow us at makamham or visit us at makamham.com. We'll end with a few closing words, but we want to make sure to answer some of the questions that might be there right now. I want to say thank you all, though, for having these, this tasting with us, for, da, for having a nani, a taste of makamham, makimu, with us. Thank you all. All right. I think while we wait for some questions to come in, um, I'd love to ask you, Vincent and Lewis, um, you know, I, I come from a place in Alaska that is, is is probably our version of what the Bay Area is. It's um, South Central Alaska where Anchorage is. And there's a reason that kind of an urban metropolis um, came into being on our traditional homelands. And in much the same way that you describe uh, folks realizing the abundance and, and it being just um, lands and waters of plenty. And I just wonder if you um, have... Uh, spoken in other uh, venues or in other conversations about California Indian ways of, of farming. Because I think um, certainly in like agricultural contexts, we think about uh, agriculture with a capital A and farming with a capital F. And that in, in I think, North Pacific cultures, at least where I'm from, um, it's much more about gathering and subsistence and, and gathering from from the abundance right and so in terms of those kinds of narratives because in mission histories and certainly in different histories in alaska um, farming was imposed as a method of control and so in the work that you do um, do these kinds of conversations come up with the with the farmers that you all work with or the work that you do in community well what we try to do thank you for asking that first of all because that's a very good question and what we try to do as much as possible is to describe why what we had in Calif what our traditional um, our traditional ways of of nurturing, stewarding foods and our landscape, why it's different than um, than what people often think with farming specifically. And the ways that we do this is by teaching about these controlled burns and the way that we were taught them and how those controlled burns how they worked to be able to produce food as well. And what that does. For us is it also reminds people that there's different ways of being able to cultivate foods there's different ways to be able to tend landscapes and different ways to be able to have abundance as well often farming is seen as being this um like this this progression often in in cultures but that doesn't feel really fair because not everybody needed farming like our ancestors they knew how to plant seeds there would be certain seeds that would be planted 
but they also knew that they didn't have to be able to create these fields that would often divert water um, in, in from other spaces because the, man, the controlled burns, they, they did what they had to do and they did it extremely well. So we wanna teach people that these burns, that this is our way of being able to have, um, to have food production, but also it's not necessary here in California in the old world to have farming either. We also know that those systems and those relationships with plant communities through controlled burns, through our methods of digging, um, all of that contributed to this incredible health of the soil. Mm -hmm. And I think there's something to be said about knowing the plants and having relationship with the plants, knowing what was best for them was not to be dug up and tilled and planted in rows and all that, it was also in a way knowing what was also best for ourselves as a people and also best for the soil. When early farming came here, there are notes of these people remarking on how onions would be planted and they would come out the size of a person's head and this this like produce that would come out incredibly healthy and that was because of all of that work of our people's hands mm -hmm. um, working with and in relationship with um, the land here that's very beautifully said ask a question um, as well and I want to just start off by saying how much I enjoyed the food you provided and wow and it, it in a way it it also made me a little sad because I wish I could have it every day. <laughs> and so my question is related to that. Um, the, you know, the, the, the the flavors, the ingredients, everything that you provided is something that, you know, I'm not alone in saying this, of how delicious they are. And I'm curious in thinking about, you know, we are in, um, you know, in the Bay Area where there's a lot of growth in food biotechnology and next generation foods and the ambitions of that. How or how could we see your foods in in context of our you know lives is or is there a, a opportunity here to grow or make these foods more wi widely available and are there risks to doing that well we encourage um, folks not to go out and gather these foods, but to grow them themselves in their backyards. And that's something that actually could make these foods more common. And something that we both like to think about, me and Lewis, is the idea of when others come to indigenous homelands, of being able to respect the native culture, the local culture, and if it's appropriate, and if it's something that the native people from whatever area would want to see happen, to be able to implement some of these cultural ways as well. An example of this is, I've always thought it was so, so sad when you go into somebody's area and you don't see any reminders that those people exist. You know, you don't see any reminders of the language, of the aesthetics, of the values, of the culinary traditions. And each one of these indigenous nations are exactly that, a nation. You know, if you go into France, for an example, you're expected to learn a little bit of French. You're expected to try some French food, to walk away learning about French architecture or whatever. You go to Japan, you know, same things are there, whatever country you go to. But it feels so, so, um, so disrespectful when indigenous cultures aren't being respected or elevated in that way when they should be. And something that we like to think about a lot is if we could imagine our cultures being respected but on our terms. Of course, we want our culture respected, but we also don't want everything that's personal to us being, um, being out there and also being uh, carried on by people outside of our community either. But there could be certain things I could imagine here in our homeland that would be respectfully done, like being able to see our place names be recognized being able to see freeway signs that have Chochenyo place names instead of the Western place names, being able to see our roundhouses and our sacred sites 
not built on and, um, and being able to see those places respected for the inherent nature of what they are. And also, when, as long as it's under our terms and our leadership, seeing our foods be able to be respected in that way too. And one way that we could get there is through indigenous leadership. That's, um, and it has to be indigenous led because otherwise it would be appropriation, but making sure that these things are being led by indigenous people. And Cafe Aloni could be in a lot of ways showing how this could look like an action, meaning that we have relationships with farmers around us, student farmers, who are making it easier, for an example, for us to be able to obtain our Indian lettuces or our, our edible flowers, our seed plants, when we're here in an urban area with 7 million people and there's challenges that we might not have if we were in areas that might be less, um, less, less urbanized, for an example. So being able to acknowledge those things and accepting um, and, and encouraging alliances when it's, a, when it's possible and when it's appropriate, but making sure that those things remain on, on our terms led by us. I hope that answers your question, but I think that that's one way that we could approach that. Um, I'd like to ask a question that I, I've heard you both speak about in, in previous um, interviews or podcasts uh, in doing my homework, and you've mentioned um, the role of, of sound, and obviously this is a selfish question, of sound and archival recordings of language and, and um, especially like the Harrington Collection, which is something that looms large here on our campus. And I would just wonder if... Um, because so much of what we just experienced, right, is, is we're able to smell, we're able to touch, we're able to taste, and to hear you both speak in your, your indigenous languages is also adding to the, the aural or the, the sound, the sonic part of this, right? Um, I was wondering if you, because of how long the acorn process takes, for example, and there was a great question in the, the Q&A about how many acorns are in one little ball, uh, like how many that represents, but are there, are there kind of other kinds of soundings or um, songs maybe that that would be um, accompanying any part of the process along the way because I we're in a, in our cluster in particular we're thinking about the role of performance and understood broadly not just song and dance and and whatnot but um, is 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 song playing a role in the kind of community led work that you both are doing um, with folks using language is 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 sound and song a big part of what do you feel like it's a big part of what you do. Absolutely. Yes. And even in our language going way back, there's sounds that are recorded as being either phrases or words. Like for an example, there's a, a, a word that's recorded in our dictionary, which is pop, 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 which is specifically the only time it's used for is to describe the boiling sound of acorn soup. Um, and so there's, there's certain sounds that correspond exactly with what they do or what they are. And when we gather our foods as well, something that we want people to in our community to feel is that when we can do these things together, vocalizing those same sounds that our ancestors vocalized, and by extension, hearing those same words that our ancestors spoke, being able to taste those same flavors, see the same landscape when we gather in these specific areas, being able to do these things together as a community, pray over the same plants that they prayed over, when we do these things together, we believe that there's, it's like a communion that happens. And when that communion happens of being able to see all of these things side, back to back, then that's when these feelings of, of almost like, I guess you can refer to them as like transcendence happen, where you can understand a world but that was before colonization and experience those things in this full way where you can taste, hear, be able to feel all of these sensations at once. And when that happens, and it's happened several times since we've done this work, you get into these, these places where it's almost like colonization didn't happen. And when that happens, there's so much, there's, there's just these feelings that, that swell inside of you, where you get to really see back to back to back to back of just how beautiful that old world was, even if it's a glimpse of it, you know, it's still being able to participate. And there's, um, there's also, of course, gathering songs that are a part of this, being able to sing over these plants, being over to, to pray over these plants in, in our language. And what that also does is it puts us in a good mindset 
So when we're gathering, you're not going to go out there and tear out plants by their roots, but you're going to gather and cut them where they should be cut. You're going to talk to the plants instead of seeing them as being something that to just abstract, but seeing them as being something that that's also has life on its own too, and something that our ancestors respected. Those things help us be able to see this landscape and these plants and life around us in a fuller way. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask a question um, from the attendees. Um, there was a question about the plant, the flower and the leaves that were included in the box. So I wondered if you could speak for a moment about the inclusion of those two things. Absolutely. So in in uh, in our language, we call springtime season which means the earth has begun to flower on us. And during this time of springtime, Ohlone people, we, we traditionally um, just have flowers everywhere around our houses, around our homes. In the old days, our ancestors, they would even go uh, even a step further with all of that. And they would make flower crowns for one another of California lilac, of poppies, of red maids, of, of all of these columbines. And they would make these flower crowns for one another that were so fragrant and so just so beautiful. And instead of talking to one another, like how we're doing in conversation right now, they would sing to one another instead to really celebrate and be in the season and to understand that we're part of a blossoming world, that we're part of this blossoming too. And this season really, this, this springtime, we're feeling that even more than, than we, I think, ever have because of the hope that we're seeing right now after such a hard winter that we all should just shared and got out of, where we're starting to see things be able to be full of life again. And right now, we're the, that wisdom from before of being in the season and recognizing that like how our flowers are blossoming, that we're part of this blossoming too. And we feel like we're blossoming during the season as well. So we wanted to put in some of the blooms that come from our homeland uh, here um, in, in all of your boxes that, that had a box. And also a little bit of Sokoti of California Bay Laurel, which for us is, uh, is, is, is extremely important in so many different ways. But for those who aren't Ohlone, it's something that you could either keep around just for wonderful for smell, or you could also um, add it to your food. If you add a leaf of it to a berry sauce you're cooking, or even oatmeal if you're cooking it, or a stew, it would um, it gives a, a flavor of our homeland from right here in the Bay Area to to your table too. Well, thank you for the last question. Um, we have uh, a couple minutes that we can go over. Uh, we've been given the go ahead. Um, I'd love to to ask you um, if you could briefly give us a. Um, I don't know, a quick version of some of your future plans, because I know with the pandemic, um, you made the decision to close the physical space in Berkeley, um, but I know you've been hosting dinners or dinner boxes, so folks listening, if, if tonight uh, uh, piqued your interest and appetite, there are other ways to continue supporting Makaham. Um, but if you two would mind um, giving us uh, uh, some more information about kind of where you think you're headed next. Thank you for asking. And Makam Hum and Cafe Ohlone, this work is too important to, to ever stop. We, we saw the success in being able to share our own story from our own voices and how far this goes. For so long, our culture has been misrepresented and it's been taught in ways that aren't always true, often full of racial stereotypes and outdated information. And what we wanna do is to, first of all, our first goal, is to always be able to provide a physical space for our community so that our community could see our culture reflected within our Ogren homeland. And right now, Cafe Ohlone, it's the only restaurant, of course, and, and it's something that we're very comfortable having that role of here in the East Bay as well, because we, we love to be able to celebrate our food, we love to celebrate our culture, and we love to be able to provide that space for our community. The secondary goal that we have which is to elevate the consciousness of the public here in the Bay Area, and by extension, the larger California, to teach them about how valuable we are, how valuable our culture is, to teach them a fuller view of our history, 
and how colonization isn't over either, that it's ongoing, that we're still living with colonization, that it's still impacting us today, that it's not like, you know, it just ended, um, you know, in 1975 or something like that, you know, but colonization, it's an ongoing thing that's still being, um, being implemented today. We believe that by teaching people this, folks are more likely to stand with us as allies and more likely to be friends of the Ohlone community. So we are going to have another physical space after the pandemic is over. But like it was being mentioned, we, we, um, we wanna be able to be safe as well. And so we wanna make sure that we're doing this in a way that's responsible. The oldest generation of our family, they lived through the Spanish flu, the last pandemic, and that disproportionately impacted Ohlone people and California Indian people, folks of color, but specifically here, it impacted our family in a way that it didn't impact um, those who weren't Ohlone here in the East Bay. And our elders created tools to be able to survive this that time. And they were relevant and they worked for this time, which was going inward, focusing on community and being as safe as we can and making sure that we take this as serious as we can. So immediately when we saw how serious COVID was getting, we asked our elders, they said, you should close, close the shop down for a while until things start getting better. We closed it down and then the cafe space that we were renting in the back, in the back of University Press Books closed. So currently what we're doing um, are once a month meal boxes called Sunday Supper, which are nine to 10 course Ohlone meals, but also culinary, culinary experiences with, um, with video messages from our elders interpreting the foods. There's um, a playlist that our grandparents curate. Uh, there's the natural elements of the landscape that we come from and beautiful locally sourced redwood um, and cedar and fur that's that are made into boxes to house these ingredients. And that's going to be the next uh, step until the safer days are here. But when safer days are here, we fully plan to reopen Cafe Aloni into a much larger version of what it was before. And what we mean by that is also having the space be a full service restaurant, but also a community space for our people so that we can have that physical space to be able to see our culture reflected in the way that we see it reflected at home. Thank you, Chan, really. Well, um, I believe we have come to the end of our event and um, was, uh, Andy, were you going to say some closing words? <laughs> yes. Uh... I, I am. Um, I, I wanted to thank all of you for really a most enlightening discussion. Um, and, and to you, Vincent and Lewis, I mean, I hope that your, your efforts and success will inspire other Native Americans in California to offer their cuisine to the public. Um, as I've observed, and I think many of us have observed this evening, food is a wonderful way to connect with everyone. It provides an opportunity to shed light on the real history of California that we heard about tonight, a history that frankly, for many of us is not very well known, as well as opening a door to building cultural respect. Um, you know, it's, it's difficult to actually express the gratitude I have for the insight provided, you know, by your presentation this evening. So I really want to thank you and I hope that um, your your restaurant can grow and, and that others um, appear alongside it uh, in the future. So thank you very much. Thank you very um, much. For those of you who are still here, the recording will be available on our website next week. So you can encourage your friends to watch if they didn't have a chance to watch tonight. And I'll now turn to future events. Um, we have a forum coming up in May the legacy of Professor Andy Walker. That'll be on May 12th. And then a couple of weeks, a week or so later, we have our next Sips and Bites, disrupting the beer wine paradigm with Professor Glenn Fox and brewmasters from the brewery in San Diego. In closing, I'd like to thank our RMI friends for supporting these events and welcome you to join our friends and encourage all of you to follow us on social media to keep up to date with upcoming RMI events and other happenings on campus. And on your way out, we'd welcome your comments on our survey. Good night. <laughs>